This is lovely. This is, a, uh, this is a very interesting boat. The most exciting thing about this boat is they survived a pirate attack in the Gulf of Aden. This thing's a speedster. She's got the water line, she's got the rig. It's wonderful. I knew you'd like that. Yeah. Hi there, this is Captain Q. Join us as we travel hither and yon to show you some great deals on some really interesting boats and maybe learn just a little bit with each one. Hey, Captain. Randy, are you out there? <laughs> Where are you? I'm right I hear there. you. Where? Oh, hey, you are, buddy. How you doing? I'm glad you found us down here. Imagine, imagine one day you're out in the middle of the, of the Indian Ocean, and the next thing you know, your nose sticks its bow into uh, the Gulf of Aden. And you're about maybe 30 miles offshore, okay? And the next thing you know, the sun is about to set on the horizon. And suddenly, out of the, out of the, out of the sunset, come two boats charging at you. And the next thing you know, your boat is covered in gunfire. <laughs> These guys are shooting at you. And what the do you do? There were two boats sailing in tandem, trying to make their way from Oman up to Aden, saw these two boats coming at them. They heard and saw bullets ripping through their Dodger, shooting at their mast that took off the spinnaker track. The one fellow in the green boat, steel boat, suddenly said, I'm not putting up with this. And when he had the chance, he turned hard over on the wheel and cut the actual boat in half. So the pirate boat cut in Pirate half. boats coming out, going after him. The other, other man in the other boat, uh, looked over and saw what was going on, and he noticed that the second boat was headed toward the stern of Jay's boat, and men were about to climb onto Jay's boat. I think they may have had a step on it. He raised his 12-gauge pump shotgun and let loose, and two of those fellows went to their reward, and one of them is probably very unhappy still today. The two sailors power to it, and they motored off at a speedy seven or eight knots to get out of there and get away from it. They left them in, the, in their wake. But wow, that's really, <laughs> that's quite a day's sail for you, I think. And I don't, I don't know that most people want to get into that situation, but we're here today to look at one of those boats. It actually is made out of steel. So it's like having your own sailing navy. This is a tough boat. Uh, there were bullets bouncing off it, going through it and everything. Not, they didn't pierce the hull, but they had, I think, 14 solid hits on the boat Wow! from uh, AK-47s. <laughs> what a story. And you know what? After eight years of circumnavigating the world and so forth, the owners have decided to hang it up. Less bullets involved. Probably no bullets involved, <laughs> hopefully. We'll take a look at uh, Gandalf, 47-foot steel sloop built in the Netherlands, designed by Franz Maas. This is old school sailing here. Full bow, full keel, attached rudder. And look at the finish on this boat. This is not a tugboat, this isn't a river barge. This is a real yacht with a real yacht finish on it. And the owner is responsible for that. He's done a great job of bringing this boat back from the edge and then taking it off around the world. It's just really incredible. Now, the first thing that, that reaches me is that this almost looked like we're standing under the bow of the PB. The PB? Oh, you don't know what the PB is? The PB is the perfect boat. This is about as fair as you can get right now. Uh, he's obviously blasted it recently and taken off any layers of, of uh, bottom paint. Uh, this is slightly ablative, but uh, in good shape. A couple little scars here. Uh, this could even be left over from uh, running over that uh, pirate in the uh, Gulf of Aden. But look up at the finish here. Look at the finish on this boat. Uh, and look at the uh, metal work that's taken place. The Dutch are very good at bending metal. There's not a lot of hard shine constructions for them. By hard shine, I mean where the bottom comes up in a, in a plate and then boop, bends uh, north and you get a hard edge all along. You see here, there's a number of zinc anodes on here to, to uh, help dissipate any electrolysis. These are practically brand new, and you really don't need to bother them. They're bolted to the bottom, and you really don't need to get rid of these or deal with these until they're at least 50% gone. We have your, your uh, speedometer here. We've seen that before, right? And uh, your depth sounder at this stage. 
She's very full. Uh, lovely lines in here. These nice slack builders. Look at the run on this keel. I love this. What's it about the full keel that you really love? I like it because if I'm going to go offshore, this would be my choice for a, a keel situation because it's going to give you all the stability you want offshore. Uh, it's going to give you the carrying ca capability. If you want to put tankage down in here, fuel tanks, water tanks, uh, even dry goods that will store right up here. She's really lovely. Franz Moss, he was born in about 1937. He was really self-taught. He tended to go toward pretty boats, I'm going to call them, with a nice long overhang, very standard for the time. This was, we're sort of looking at original SNS design underbody here, Sparkman Stevens. What, what are some of your concerns with steel versus fiberglass? Steel is just a little bit more maintenance than fiberglass. You really should every three years or so haul the boat a minimum of three years probably and just check for rust. I mean, it's steel, steel rust. Are you going to see rust out here? Do we see rust? No, but the problem is that rust tends to come from the inside out. They would cover, if you had a, a, full, a full analysis of this hull, they would cover it with a series of squares all right beside each other in just chalk and they put little X's in each one of those squares. Then they come along with their meter, and with a little gob of jelly on the meter, they stick it up against the hull, and they get the reading. Usually, if, I guess if they saw 25% uh, to 30% wastage, then that's an area they're going to mark and say, we've got to look at that. Yes, they're a little bit more to be concerned with, but when you hit that reef... Or that it, pirate ship. Or that pirate ship, you're going to be glad you've got a lot of metal in front of you. A steel boat is tough to beat. Just take care of it and it'll take care of you. Now uh, we have a big rudder on the end here. I think she's far enough aft you're going to have enough control and with the long, the long keel in front of it, the boat's going to be stable so you're not going to be wiggling around like uh, you know modern uh, fin keel uh, spade rudder situation. This thing's a speedster. She's got the water line, she's got the rig. Notice we have another, another zinc right here and we've got a big plate on this side. Sometimes uh, people uh, use plates like that for grounding purposes, uh, grounding batteries and so forth. But this boat has been set up so that all negative leads come right back to the, to the uh, battery itself. Clever thinking. So we're going to look up in the air and look at the stern of this boat. And right now, right up there you go, you think you're looking at the bow almost. Yeah, it's a double ender. It's a double ender. It's sort of a canoe stern, they call that. A really, really pretty uh, under sail. But this is gorgeous, and the finish on this boat is remarkable, just remarkable. She's really pretty, really pretty underwater. And this boat will probably uh, roll along at 9 to 10 knots off the wind with a good breeze. Let's go topsides. Let's do it. Here are the, uh, uh, the, the double-slotted headstay by Proferl. It's all in great shape on this particular boat. And you can haul up two sails, uh, two jibs going downwind and a uh, nice wing and wing arrangement. Everything is really solid. Up forward here, you see this big Maxwell uh, windlass, and it has little extra handles on here to give you, if you need to give something a hand or to move that without the electric uh, uh, switch running it. The thing that's keeping me from flying off this foredeck <laughs> into the concrete below is an Aries wind vane. This would mount on the stern of the boat just on either side of that canoe transom that we saw. Really large, uh, cleats on the foredeck here. Just by scale, there's a 10-inch piece of paper right beside it. We've got handrails right along the side of the cabin top here. The shrouds, this is a fitting, instead of a swedge fitting, where they stick the wire into uh, a metal tube, like so, and then squeeze the heck out of the tube. This is a fit up with Norseman type fittings. Uh, this goes down and the wire is splayed open and put over a little cone inside there then this nut tightens down on that. And these are wonderful because, among other things, you can check the condition of them. You can actually undo that, take a look at it, put it back together. Very strong. This mast has been on the boat for 40 years. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you 35. My God, I love it. I love this mast. I love this mast. I love this mast. This wooden spar, hollow spar, has been on the boat uh, since 19... Uh, 60, so that's 40, 20, 60 years. And uh, she's in great shape. Somewhere in here might have been where the bullet struck uh, and uh, took part of this spinnaker track off. Gives it character. 
She has a single set of spreaders and a set of jumpers at the top. What's the jumper? Uh, that's a triangular uh, shaped uh, set of spreaders up there. This is a three quarter rig mast, meaning the head stay only goes up three quarters of the way. And that allows the, the owner to put more tension on the, on the main sole by cranking it up on a back stay and pulling the mast slightly back like so. Uh, and as it does that, it's gonna t those jumpers will keep the lower section, the next section from following it. It'll keep it straight. Now, remember what we call this puppy? The gooseneck. That is the gooseneck. and allows this boom to uh, go up and down on this pin and to swing in and out. And actually at one point during that attack, Jay just swung this boom out and whacked him. And uh, it got their attention. It's a good move. Very good move, and you don't want to mess with Jay offshore, and you don't want to mess with Gandalf anywhere. Let's take a look. We've got to work our way under the uh, little bit of shrink wrap on this boat. This is a very wide deck. Actually, Randy and I just passed each other on this deck. You found me back here behind the helm of Gandalf. So what are these two spheres near their compass? I thought you'd never ask. Now, <laughs> uh, these two spheres, are called, and uh, you got to remember this because this is going to be on the final exam. Quadrantal spheres. Quadrantal spheres. Say it seven times and it'll be yours. And you also get a, we will reward you with one of these to take home. <laughs> these two big iron balls will um, keep you true on your course. I'm elevated. I can see right over the cabin top uh, through the Dodger. It's very comfortable up here. And this is a nice curved seat. This drum will connect to the lines that go to the Aries wind vane that sits on the stern. This is a big cockpit, uh, and it's a little bit of a fooler because it's very deep. When you sit down in it, you're really inside the boat. It's great. And it's two levels. It's a, a two-level cockpit, one for the call it passengers, and one for the captain and other crew up along here, and then, of course, the navigation bench on top. It's wonderful. Six-part tackle for the main sheet. And that six parts here will make it very easy to pull this in. All the metal work behind that holds up the radar unit and there's also a, uh, a wind vane that will generate electricity. Here you see these two levers and what this does, those are for the running backstays. They help hold the mass steady when you're off the wind especially uh, or if it's really blowing, you want, you want to put something extra on it. Okay. The high field lever does it all. These are two running backstays. We go off to either side of the boat, and then there's a fixed backstay. The cockpit is uh, really, really very nice. And I have to tell you, standing here, I would feel very secure from anybody fast approaching me with an AK-47. Or the last one, anyway, back in 2005, had a couple of aeration holes in it. It's a little different because we're quite low right now. But notice how, how high, we've talked about combings before. Uh, this is the record setting so far. We've never had one where you could lean out it like you're in a car window. This is, this is terrific. And everything, everything here is steel. Nothing's gonna break or scratch. There's some finish work that you could do to, to uh, brighten it up a little bit, but it just, it's, it looks natural. It looks like what it should look like uh, for a boat of this period, this age. We have a little port light here down here. I imagine, what do you think's gonna come through there? Sandwiches? Yep, drive-by. <laughs> Directly beneath me is the engine. Now this is pretty interesting, and it's basically the same concept as a uh, Harley-Davidson belt drive motorcycle. In the center is the belt right here that will drive the drive shaft way down in this bilge down there. Never quite seen one like that, but he's really done that, and the owner of this boat engineered that himself. So it's really neat. Uh, all his wiring and his plumbing and everything in here, by the way, is quite neat and tidy. 50 horsepower Yanmar engine. Uh, engine mounts are really f nice and fresh, and uh, they're fastened with stainless bolts. We've opened up the whole engine area here, and you will see you've got just about everything you need right in front of you here. Uh, can't quite get under the engine, but pretty close to it. Also sitting here, you notice some of the construction, the steel. So that's the engine room. And uh, it's just right as rain. They've made all the concessions necessary to be able to get, uh, to be totally safe when it's sea. 
Here's another method we like to use. We call this the downward facing dog. <laughs> Uh, we're right here in the galley. Everything is right within an arm's reach. The navigation table, the, the head with just the flush in it, and then here is the stove and uh, the sinks. Now, what do I like about sinks? You like two. Yep. One for rinse, one for wash. Yep. How about deep? You know, oh my God, I go right down in these sinks. They're so deep. These are like, I don't know, they're that deep. That's a very deep sink. See, it comes right there. Water's not going to slop out of there when you're, when you're in motion. There is no hot water on the boat. They just decided for some reason that it wasn't necessary. And really when you're down in the South Pacific, you don't need a whole lot of hot water. This nice space, I'm nice and tight in here. Storage lockers from the top, from the, the bottom there, wire mesh, plentiful. And then of course the ubiquitous uh, pot and pan storage. And there is refrigeration on the boat. It's an Adler Barber electric system, I believe. So there's a freezer compartment over here, and then for your fresh stores uh, and, and uh, the daily use on this side. It's a split section. So here's our working living area. The uh, cockpit is right there, totally safe. So uh, I've now stepped down just a little half step into the uh, main salon here. I've just pulled up a floor panel here. We can see the interior plating on the boat. Just casual approach. What I'm liking and, and not seeing is the fact that I'm not seeing mounds of rust, and that's not unusual. This area here, if it's left moist, if there's bilge water left too long, uh, it will you collect moisture up here, and this will start to rust from the inside outward. And I don't see an issue with that. And there's a very nice L-shaped settee, and I'm sorry, but uh, Sea Dog is taking that over for now. Uh, we have a fold-up table, so. Uh, you can eat from either side of it. We have a nice settee on the other side, and it has storage underneath it. Uh, you can see down there, uh, ditty bags, extra shackles, grease. Three forward deadlights right here uh, coming in. There are four opening ports, two on each side, and then four very large main cabin windows right here. So you don't need to feel like you're in a hole down here. This is very bright, really nice. Again, a couple people cruising everywhere. This would be considered the, uh, the owner's cabin with two berths, and there's an upper and lower Pullman style sort of arrangement here, complete with bunk boards. Now here we have a real set of bunk boards, and right behind Randy there's a whole stack of sails. And somebody always asks about sails. This material feels, it's all crackly and fresh. This is really old sails, feel like uh, an old dish rag. These feel like they just came off the, the sailmaker's floor. Here's a big storage locker. Gear and stuff you want to bring with you on a, on a sailboat on a long cruise. You can never have enough storage. No shortage of, of, of storage for your gear or your clothes. So there's an upper and lower here, two berths. And then forward, again, this is really tricky. There's a big, uh, there's a big double here. This is lovely. This is, uh, uh, this is a very interesting boat. I think for the serious voyager, somebody that says, uh, I want to go around the world, uh, this is a boat to really look long and hard at. She's had t time at sea. She's survived pirates. Uh, she's been caught up in 65 knot gales off Bermuda. And uh, she's really survived well from the condition of the boat and also from the condition of the crew. It doesn't have all the sort of... Uh, Oh, new amenities that come with boats. Like you know, We've seen boats with more than one head. Right now, they just needed one head. These are very quiet, very solid, very secure. You'll barely hear the sea hitting the sides of the boat. So it's a wonderful boat. A wonderful, I'm really glad we've had a chance to come see it. Randy, we just had a great day looking at not just a, a cruising boat, but a voyaging boat. This was the 47-foot steel-hulled Gandalf, uh, built in the Netherlands, and then restored by its present owner. The most exciting thing about this boat, more than almost any other boat, is they survived a pirate attack in the Gulf of Aden. Pretty incredible when you hear the story. When he was being attacked by unscrupulous characters in uh, high-speed boats, he said enough of that and turned 
Gandalf right into one of them and practically cut it in half. Incredible. I mean, what an amazing boat. And to know that he felt so strongly about the strength of his boat that he had no qualms about doing it. He just said, you're not gonna shoot at me anymore? Boom, that's it. Now, this is a lovely couple who were just trying to cruise around the world. It was really set up for just the two of them, not a normal 47-footer. And many 47-footers would make her look small. But when you get in there, and I know what that boat's gonna feel like when she's under sail and, and driving through the waves, you're gonna feel very safe, secure, and very comfortable for two people. And there is room for the occasional couple. This is so unusual, this one. This is another really unusual boat. There's no question she's been floating. We give her a 10. She has been around the world. She deserves a good, strong eight after that. Wow. Yes, the eight is for the design and the way it was implemented for their purposes. And that's really important. They just didn't see how many heads they could have on the boat or how many berths they could put in there. They said, we want a good seaworthy boat that's gonna take us anywhere we wanna go with impunity. That makes you 35. My God, I love it. I love this mess. I love this mess. I love this mess. Are you sure it's running? Yeah. How do you know it's running? <laughs> oh, you're the, I'm you're, the director. You're the director. I forgot that. Uh, this is Randy, the director of the Captain Q uh, episode. This, of course, is Sea Dog right here. And we really want to thank all of you out there for staying with us and bearing up with our learning curve. <laughs> learning curve, a little bit of silliness. Yeah. Thanks so much to everybody for watching, subscribing, interacting, and telling us your thoughts. We really appreciate how quickly it's grown and looking forward to a lot more episodes. And <laughs> there we go. We got the right shot, right? <laughs> if you like what you see, please hit the subscribe button. And if you want to be notified when the next one comes out, please hit the alert bell. And that's not desperate at all. That we're having too good a time doing these things. So, uh, you can hit the bell or not.